Section 28 of Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young by Jacob Abbott. 28. Religious Training. Part 1. Chapter 23. Religious Training. It has been my aim in this volume to avoid, as far as possible, all topics involving controversy, and only to present such truths, and to elucidate such principles, as can be easily made to commend themselves to the good sense and the favorable appreciation of all the classes of minds likely to be found among the readers of the work. There are certain very important aspects of the religious question, which may be presented, I think, without any serious deviation from this policy. In what true piety consists? Indeed, I think there is far more real than seeming agreement among parents in respect to this subject or rather a large portion of the apparent difference consists in different modes of expressing in words thoughts and conceptions connected with spiritual things which from their very nature cannot any of them be adequately expressed in language at all and thus it happens that what are substantially the same ideas are customarily clothed by different classes of persons in very different phraseology while on the other hand the same set of phrases actually represent in different minds very different sets of ideas for instance there is perhaps universal agreement in the idea that some kind of change a change too of a very important character is implied in the implanting or developing of the spirit of piety in the heart of a child there is also universal agreement in the fact often very emphatically asserted in the New Testament, that the essential principles in which true piety consists are those of entire submission in all things to the will of God and cordial kind feeling towards every man. There is endless disagreement and much earnest contention among different denominations of Christians in respect to the means by which the implanting of these principles is to be secured and to the modes in which when implanted they will manifest themselves but there is not so far as would appear any dissent whatever anywhere from the opinion that the end to be aimed at is the implanting of these principles that is that it consists in bringing the heart to a state of complete and cordial submission to the authority and to the will of god and to a sincere regard for the welfare and happiness of every human being a question of words there seems at first view to be a special difference of opinion in respect to the nature of the process by which these principles come to be implanted or developed in the minds of the young for all must admit that in early infancy they are not there or at least they do not appear no one would expect to find in two infants twin brothers we will suppose creeping on the floor with one apple between them that there could be at that age any principles of right or justice or of brotherly love existing in their hearts that could prevent their both crying and quarrelling for it true says one but there are germs of those principles which in time will be developed no rejoins another there are no germs of them there are only capacities for them through which by divine power the germs may hereafter be introduced but when we reflect upon the difficulty of forming any clear and practical idea of the difference between a germ and a bud upon an apple tree for instance which may ultimately produce fruit and a capacity for producing it 
which may subsequently be developed, and still more how difficult it is to picture to our minds what is represented by these words in the case of a human soul, it would seem as if the apparent difference in people's opinions on such a point must be less a difference in respect to facts than in respect to the phraseology by which the facts should be represented. And there would seem to be confirmation of this view in the fact that the great apparent difference among men in regard to their theoretical views of human nature does not seem to produce any marked difference in their action in practically dealing with it. Some parents, it is true, habitually treat their children with gentleness, kindness, and love. Others are harsh and severe in all their intercourse with them. But we should find, on investigation, that such differences have very slight connection with the theoretical views of the nature of the human soul which the parents respectively entertain. Parents who, in their theories, seem to think the worst of the native tendencies of the human heart are often as kind and considerate and loving in their dealings with it as any, while no one would be at all surprised to find another who is very firm in his belief in the native tendency of childhood to good showing himself in practically dealing with the actual conduct of children fretful impatient complaining and very ready to recognize in fact tendencies which in theory he seems to deny and so two bank directors or members of the board of management of any industrial undertaking when they meet in the street on sunday in returning from their respective places of public worship if they fall into conversation on the moral nature of man may find or think they find that they differ extremely in their views and may even think each other bigoted or heretical as the case may be but yet the next day when they meet at a session of their board and come to the work of actually dealing with the conduct and the motives of men they may find that there is practically no difference between them whatever or if there should be any difference such as would show itself in a greater readiness in one than in the other to place confidence in the promises or to confide in the integrity of men the difference would, in general, have no perceptible relation whatever to the difference in the theological phraseology which they have been accustomed to hear and to assent to in their respective churches. All of which seems to indicate, as has already been said, that the difference in question is rather apparent than real and that it implies less actual disagreement about the facts of human nature than diversity in the phraseology by which the facts are represented. Agency of the Divine Spirit It may, however, be said that in this respect, if not in any other, there is a radical difference among parents in respect to human nature in relation to the religious education of children, namely, that some think that the implanting of the right principles of repentance for all wrongdoing, and sincere desires for the future to conform in all things to the will of God, and seek the happiness and welfare of men, cannot come except by a special act of divine intervention and is utterly beyond the reach, in respect to any actual efficiency, of all human instrumentalities. This is no doubt true, but it is also no less true in respect to all the powers and capacities of the human soul, as well as to those pertaining to moral and religious duty. If the soul itself is the product of the creative agency of God, all its powers and faculties must be so and consequently the development of them all and there certainly can be no reason for making the sentiment of true and genuine piety an exception 
must be the work of the same creative power. But someone may say, there is, however, after all, a difference, for while we all admit that both the original entrance of the embryo soul into existence and every step of its subsequent progress and development, including the coming into being and into action of all its various faculties and powers, are the work of the supreme creative power. The commencement of the divine life in the soul is, in a special and peculiar sense, the work of the divine hand. And this also is doubtless true. At least, there is a certain important truth expressed in that statement. And yet, when we attempt to picture to our minds two modes of divine action, one of which is special and peculiar, and the other is not so, we are very likely to find ourselves bewildered and confused, and we soon perceive that in making such inquiries we are going out of our depth, or in other words, are attempting to pass beyond the limits which mark the present boundaries of human knowledge. In view of these thoughts and suggestions, in the truth of which it would seem that all reasonable persons must concur, we may reasonably conclude that all parents who are willing to look simply at the facts, and who are not too much trammeled by the forms of phraseology to which they are accustomed, must agree in admitting the substantial soundness of the following principles relating to the religious education of children. Order of Development in Respect to Different Propensities and Powers Illustration The First Instinct 1. We must not expect any perceptible awakening of the moral and religious sentiments too soon, nor feel discouraged and disheartened because they do not earlier appear. For, like all the other higher attributes of the soul, they pertain to a portion of the mental structure which is not early developed. It is the group of purely animal instincts that first show themselves in the young, and those even as we see in the young of the lower animals generally appear somewhat in the order in which they are required for the individual's good birds just hatched from the egg seem to have for the first few days only one instinct ready for action that of opening their mouths wide at the approach of anything towards their nest even this instinct is so imperfect and immature that it cannot distinguish between the comings of their mother and the appearance of the face of a boy peering down upon them, or even the rustling of the leaves around them by a stick. In process of time, as their wings become formed, another instinct begins to appear, that of desiring to use the wings and come forth into the air. The development of this instinct and the growth of the wings advance together. Later still, when the proper period of maturity arrives, other instincts appear as they are required, such as the love of a mate, the desire to construct a nest, and the principle of maternal affection. Now there is something analogous to this, in the order of development to be observed, in the progress of the human being through the period of infancy to that of maturity and we must not look for the development of any power or susceptibility before its time, nor be too much troubled if we find that, in the first two or three years of life, the animal propensities, which are more advanced in respect to the organization which they depend upon, seem sometimes to overpower the higher sentiments and principles, which, so far as the capacity for them exists at all, must be yet in embryo. We must be willing to wait for each to be developed in its own appointed time. Dependence upon Divine Aid 2. 
anyone who is ready to feel and to acknowledge his dependence upon divine aid for anything whatever in the growth and preservation of his child will surely be ready to do so in respect to the work of developing or awakening in his heart the principles of piety since it must be admitted by all that the human soul is the highest of all the manifestations of divine power and that that portion of its structure on which the existence and exercise of the moral and religious sentiments depend is the crowning glory of it it is right therefore i mean right in the sense of being truly philosophical that if the parent feels and acknowledges his dependence upon divine power in anything he should specially feel and acknowledge it here while there is nothing so well adapted as a deep sense of this dependence and a devout and habitual recognition of it and reliance upon it to give earnestness and efficiency to his efforts and to furnish a solid ground of hope that they will be crowded with success the christian paradox three the great principle so plainly taught in the sacred scriptures namely that while we depend upon the exercise of divine power for the success of all our efforts for our own spiritual improvement or that of others just as if we could do nothing ourselves we must do everything that is possible ourselves just as if nothing was to be expected from divine power may be called the christian paradox Quote, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is god that worketh in you both to will and to do End quote. it would seem it might be thought much more logical to say quote, work out your own salvation for there is nobody to help you end quote or quote, it is not necessary to make any effort yourselves for it is god that worketh in you end quote. it seems strange and paradoxical to say quote, work out your own salvation for it is god that worketh in you both to will and to do end quote but in this as in all other paradoxes the difficulty is in the explanation of the theory and not in the practical working of it there is in natural philosophy what is called the hydrostatic paradox which consists in the fact that a small quantity of any liquid as for example the coffee in the nose of the coffee pot will balance and sustain a very much larger quantity as that contained in the body of it so as to keep the surface of each at the same level young students involve themselves sometimes in hopeless entanglements among the steps of the mathematical demonstration showing how this can be but no housekeeper ever meets with any practical difficulty in making her coffee rest quietly in its place on account of it the christian paradox in the same way gives rise to a great deal of metaphysical floundering and bewilderment among young theologians in their attempts to vindicate and explain it but the humble-minded christian parent finds no difficulty in practice it comes very easy to him to do all he can just as if everything depended upon his efforts and at the same time to cast all his care upon god just as if there was nothing at all that he himself could do means must be right means four we are apt to imagine or at least to act sometimes as if we imagined that our dependence upon the divine aid for what our saviour jesus designated as the new birth makes some difference in the obligation on our part to employ such means as are naturally adapted 
to the end in view. If a gardener, for example, were to pour sand from his watering pot upon his flowers in time of drought instead of water, he might make something like a plausible defense of his action in reply to remonstrance thus i have no power to make the flowers grow and bloom the secret processes on which the successful result depends are altogether beyond my reach and in the hands of god and he can just as easily bless one kind of instrumentality as another i am bound to do something it is true for i must not be idle and inert but god if he chooses to do so can easily bring out the flowers into beauty and bloom however imperfect and ill-adapted the instrumentalities i use may be he can as easily make use for his purpose of sand as of water now although there may be a certain plausibility in this reason such conduct would appear to every one perfectly absurd and yet many parents seem to act on a similar principle a mother who is from time to time during the week fretful and impatient evincing no sincere and hearty consideration for the feelings still less for the substantial welfare and happiness of those dependent upon her who shows her in submission to the will of god by complaints and repinings in anything untoward that befalls her and who evinces a selfish love for her own gratification her dresses her personal pleasures and her fashionable standing and then as a means of securing the salvation of her children is very strict when sunday comes in enforcing them to read good books or in repressing on that day any undue exuberance of their spirits relying upon the blessing of god upon her endeavors will be very apt to find in the end that she has been watering her delicate flowers with sand the means which we use to awaken or impart the feelings of sorrow for sin submission to god and cordial good will to man in which all true piety consists must be means that are appropriate in themselves to the accomplishment of the end intended the appliance must be water and not sand or rather water or sand with judgment discrimination and tact for the gardener often finds that a judicious mixture of sand with the clayey and clammy soil about the roots of his plants is just what is required the principle is that the appliance must be an appropriate one that is one indicated by a wise consideration of the circumstance of the case and of the natural characteristics of the infantile mind end of section twenty eight recording by bill mosley bernardo texas U.S.A.